I'm probably going to get to use the pirate voice in this one. Yeah. The Maritime Court Martial. Opening arguments posted by <gasps> user Ramtide. Welcome back, my friend. This is, of course, extra long. Subscribe to Red X, K. Okay? <laughs> Good reminder. <laughs> I am super giddy to, to see my old buddy posting again, but I'm going to take a deep breath. I think it's got a, a serious nature to it. Okay, it's about a court martial. By the flickering light of the torches, Blue's crimson blood glistened. It ran down Madigan's outstretched arms in torrents as her lifeless corpse collapsed onto the floor of the sewers, her head held high above her body, still twitching like a decapitated chicken. The wicked spell of the dark god that she sought to resurrect was broken and through the sewers echoed the cry of the victor. Above the table, things were panning out radically different. Shock gave way to tears, and tears gave way to an awkward silence, as one player turned to those gathered around them and leveled their accusation of betrayal against the party, and I rubbed the bridge of my nose as those same feelings turned themselves against me. Record scratch? Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got into this situation. Let's go back to the beginning. Or do the intro. Ram Tidings, dear friends. It is I, your dutiful lord and master, the Eternal GM. This was posted specifically for the Red X YouTube channel. And it has been some time since I've written for you. Perhaps the necessity of experience had not yet come to fuel the spark of inspiration. But an experience has been delivered into my lap, which I feel compelled to relay to you all. Despite my wild escapades across this country, it should come as no surprise that I still entertain my favorite hobby. After all, you only really need dice and your imagination. And indulge in my hobbies, I do. Running campaigns from the comfort of wild camps by the way of the internet. Hail internet! I do need to join in on one of those sessions eventually, or maybe live stream it. That could be cool. With the resolution of this tale, however, I felt compelled to tell it to you in hindsight. So let us delve into a story of note, one sure to kindle intrigue and curiosity and debate, a story of main character syndrome, above and below board knowledge, and an agent of chaos battling the very chaos that they have created. <laughs> it sounds so grandiose. You're getting me all excited. <laughs> Let's get right into it, and we will submit this story to the Maritime Court of Public R slash RPG Horror Stories opinion. The charge has been levied. Was above board knowledge used to influence the course of the game? Though human memory is far from a perfect tool for recording all that had transpired, I will still be presenting both prosecution and defense as fairly and impartially as I humanly can. Gather round, children, for another turn! from the tabletop! Oh, it feels good to say it again. <laughs> I'm just gonna come right out and say this much, okay? This isn't your grandpappy's dungeon crawl. Uncomfortable topics and depictions will arise because uncomfortable topics and descriptions will arise because uncomfortable topics and descriptions will arise. <laughs> Maybe in this installment, and most certainly in the future, so steal yourselves, adventurers. But first, let us assemble our party. To protect the identities of all parties involved, we will observe our usual naming conventions. Will we use the names of their characters during our tabletop session? The Admiralty, yes, R.O.P. Ram Tidings. And he's got six party members, which seems like a handful, but maybe it's good for playtesting purposes. The first party member is Kale Kinnanian, a dear friend of mine who sat in on the writing and playtesting of Blood and Thunder. My idea guy, my boy, awesome company, and hell of a frontline pugilist tank driven to master the arts of the forge. Second party member is Ingmund, another dear friend who sat in on the writing and playtesting. This campaign, he's playing a dwarven rifleman with a burning desire to start up a brothel. <laughs> Yeah, why not? Easy money, I guess. We gotta aim high. Don't let our dreams be dreams. <laughs> the third party member is Alistair Fenix, a newer arrival to our table, invited by the illustrious Ingmund to join our game. I haven't known him very long, but he's generally a pretty cool dude who's able to roll with the punches, playing a pistol-slinging pirate, always with a plan to backstab and betray for his own benefit. 
fourth party member, Julio. An odd one out from this bizarre cast list. Julio just wants to cook, S.A. He's got all his recipes from Abuelita. He's a professional at dapping people up and is the cousin of Sancho. Orale, Holmes. <laughs> Hooray. I will take the Huevos Rancheros. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, fifth cast list member is Blue, the engine of chaos herself. Sweet and silly on the outside, a bloodthirsty cannibal on the inside. Sixth party member, Madigan Shots. Another odd one out from this bizarre collection of rabble and nearly a saint compared to the rest of them. Another frontline swashbuckler, uncomfortable with the life of piracy and a devout follower of the Church of Krios. He would honestly probably be more at home as a priest. And you can do exactly that, but then you don't get to come on our pirate adventure. <laughs> The name of the game is Blood and Thunder. It is my fevered love letter to the Age of Sail, a sordid soiree into the world of maritime piracy that I hope titillates and amuses you. Also, it's basically in beta at this point, and we'll be receiving plenty of edits. If you would like to support, it's available on ramtide.itch.io for the price of free, or pay what you want if you want to help out our boy. So first, I feel it might be appropriate to speak to you all of the tones of the games that we run and simultaneously reveal some tangentially related information to the tale at hand from previous campaigns before we really get into the meat and the substance of this particular adventure. At this table, we do not believe in happy-go-lucky adventure time, and I always strive to make that abundantly clear to new players who are coming into our group. This is not Pirates of the Caribbean, it is Doom and Gloom Edge Max Death Grind. There are no heroes coming to save the day. There are expendable cutthroats to whom you shouldn't get too attached, looking to either get rich or die trying. Yeah, that guy's name is 50 Shillings. <laughs> we play Pirate Souls. Death, disaster, and misfortune always wait just around the corner sometimes in anticlimactic and easily avoidable ways. Running off alone to fight a creature is a good way to wind up dead very quickly. I've seen a whole party wipe themselves because they let the torch lights go out inside the belly of an anglerfish. Slow and painful demises at the hands of hunger and thirst are not unheard of. I've even had a character poop themselves to death. <laughs> Why are we not hearing that story right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, character death should be expected, and all that keeps a party alive, despite the threats that they face, is clever, on-your-feet thinking, good resource management, superior tactics, and maybe just a little bit of luck. Built to lose, that's the tabletop that I fell in love with. <laughs> with the amount of characters that we went through in our first campaign, particularly among the veteran player group, Death should be neither surprising nor should it sting when it occurs. It's just a facet of the game. Our veterans of the party are Kale, Ingman, and Blue. All of them were there from the very start of our forays into the world of Erda. Our first campaign raged across an unfamiliar continent akin to not South America, populated by warring tribal factions, conquistadors, and colonists as the party searched for a mythical city of silver in the heart of the Quetelan Empire, referred to as La Platanad. It was during this first campaign that I learned about the types of characters that my players like to run, and a little bit more about who they are as people. Kale was very much a slippery bastard, rarely falling to the worst that I could throw at him, unless his friends were directly threatened, or he was sleep deprived. A brilliant strategist mind with a heart of gold. Ingman himself was of the philosophy that cowardice tended to save lives, and he was quick to flee a losing combat, even at the expense of the lives of the rest of his crew. And keep him alive it did. <laughs> but Blue, uh, Blue was very much a wild card. I can recall during the first few sessions how Blue, at that point named Red, bit out the throat of a desperate opponent tribal warrior who was trying to surrender. Unceremoniously, she gnawed upon the torn chunks of throat in her maw before spitting them into the white beach sand. Dude, that's metal. <laughs> How brutal can you get? Then, soaked in the blood of the slain, ready to deceive the village from which they had ventured forth, donned the clothes of that same dead tribal warrior. 
said throatless dead tribal who just so happened to be sick with smallpox. <laughs> Whoops. And of course, she contracted this crippling disease for herself. As it progressed, she found herself increasingly desperate to rid herself of her ailments. Her ruse to deceive the tribals and glean the information that they sought failed, and conflict rapidly ensued. After the battle at the village, when the elders were all dead and the rest of the party had fled elsewhere, Blue, the sole survivor and the last to remain at the site of this carnage, sought out the children of the village from among the burning huts. Bro, that's heartless, but also leverage. <laughs> we are playing pirates here, aren't we? And there in the wreckage, Blue found the terrified chieftain's daughter and coaxed them to her side. When the child was within her grasp, she seized them and placed them upon the altar at the far end of the village, tore their heart out, oh, <laughs> there goes the leverage, <laughs> sacrificing them upon the altar, hoping to appease the jungle spirits and cure her of the disease that now coursed through her system. A few magic rolls later, and Blue had not only failed to rid herself of her disease through the murder of this innocent, but had actively provoked it into worsening by displeasing the spirits that she beseeched to cure her. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> With her state only worsening, it was only a matter of time before Blue could no longer hide her condition. When the rash became noticeable, Kale made remarks about Blue's declining health. This was not taken well by Blue, Kale, the then doctor of the ship, and Blue had themselves a standoff on the beach in the presence of the other members of their crew, wherein the doctor remarked that she was a bearer of disease, and that letting her back on the ship would risk killing them all. Blue, in open duplicity, lied through her teeth, accusing Kale of actually being the plague bearer in front of that same audience. This ruse, however, failed by will of the dice, and Blue was bound. Bro, those dice don't seem to like blue none too much. <laughs> she was to hold hospice in a shack just north of the mooring points of their ship until she either recovered or she died. Blue played her hand once more at deceit and treachery and remarked that she was as good as dead to the small detachment of crew that was tasked with escorting her to the shack wherein she was to reside until the sickness was sorted out. And this time, her gambit proved successful. Just toss me in the sea, she opined. Just let me drown in the waves. Her escort shrugged, decided it would be a much faster resolution to the situation at hand, and threw her into the waters. She slipped her bonds and then made a break to the ship. Oh my god. <laughs> this is some high tension PvP, I love it. There, in a fit of vengeance, she sought out Kale, with whom she held a grudge for not doing more to help her, and she attempted to end his life. When the tide of battle turned against her in one final act of defiance, she opened up her throat and both wrists, spilling her smallpox-infused blood all about the decks and the cabins. <laughs> God damn, dude. That's one way to go, I guess. The ship was subsequently burnt and scuttled in order to save the lives of the crew, that same campaign, not even three sessions later, Blue, as her new character, made an attempt on the captain's life, citing that his failure to prevent the loss of the ship was justification for the termination of his command. Eh, it fits in character, but I don't know. Seems like you're holding the grudge here. Like all of a sudden this new guy shows up and demands a mutiny? <laughs> I don't know, man. It doesn't work 100% in character. Uh, this attempt also failed, of course, principally because the rest of the party who planned to participate in this mutiny did not uphold their ends of the devised stratagem to depose of the former captain. So another character, <laughs> up in flames. <laughs> and then when at last the dice favored a less cunning build, because we do random generation here, her bloodthirst seemed to abate, as Blue roleplayed Der Berg. A bear of very little brain, but quite the fighter, who lasted till the end of our previous campaign, when the whole party was wiped out in the belly of an anglerfish. It was then that I could surmise the nature of this player by these previous experiences. They were an agent of chaos, alright, willing to go to whatever extremes they felt justified in going to, in order to achieve whatever ends they were hoping to achieve. Very much a no-holds-barred type 
and those who stood in the way of that would most assuredly find themselves marked for disposal. <laughs> most other GMs would probably have pulled them aside and said, hey, you might be a bit antagonistic to the aims of the party and I don't think this is going to work out. And were I not playing a game that deliberately encourages inter-party hostility and a disposable attitude towards your characters, I might have done just that. But we are playing a game that encourages inter-party hostility. <laughs> the motivations of piracy are treasure and necessity, not lofty ideals or character development or some vague fairy tale moral point. And deceit and betrayal and backstabbing is something that I believe to be the necessary spirit of Blood and Thunder. I will GM anything if the party can handle it with respect and maturity and honor the roll of the dice. Winner takes all and dead men tell no tales. I would be kind of excited to play this for one session before I throw the character into a paper shredder. <laughs> now if we're being honest about all things, I like Blue. I'll never forget the unease that her characters create because her characters were the rogue element. Everyone expects me to kill them, but when the PC starts going rogue, it brings a degree of butt-cheek-clenching tension to the table that I absolutely savor because as a GM, I can't really channel that. GM kills you? It's standard. Player character kills you? What a twist! <laughs> When the party is breaking down into factional violence against each other and nobody knows who to trust and everyone's lying through their teeth or in it for their own hide, the treacherous nature of this game we were playing was truly captured. Blue had done my job for me. I was enjoying it and I would have been content to continue enjoying it so long as we continued to proceed with the expected degree of maturity and honor on behalf of all parties involved. And truth be told, I don't even just like Blue as a character or as a driver of the tabletop tension, but as a person and a friend. Even though we've not spoken for some time now, after the conclusion of this tale, maybe I'll write this to organize my thoughts on the matter of everything that transpired. Maybe I sit here wondering after all is said and done, what else is there left to say between us? And so, I just let it lie, and I will put this to the page for posterity instead. The 8-Ball says the answer is unclear, but write it I do and publish it, I will. Alright, so that's all the backstory and characters. 20 minutes in, I have not even a single regret. You've just made me want to play Blood and Thunder more than ever. We play weirdos and waifus sometimes on the channel, but yeah, this would be interesting. Everybody can gather around and say Red X is sussy. <laughs> that's how this works, right? <laughs> anyway... After we wrapped up our last campaign, I found myself on a bit of a hiatus due to the pressing demands of real life and a broken down vehicle. That stuff stings when you're already living on the edge, but when that hiatus found itself resolved, in no small part thanks to the gracious kindnesses of the greater Red X YouTube community, yeah we got you fam, <laughs> I popped back into the Discord one night after work and said, hey gang, we're firing up the dice again, and everyone was stoked. They said, hell yeah, Admiral, where are we going this time? And I began to plot out the campaign setting for our current adventure. Rather than return to not South America, we decided instead that we were going north, far north, to the frozen wastelands of the bitter north. And some of the old crew was ready to set sail once more. I decided this time around that I would ease up on the murder gas just a little bit and make the rewards more plentiful so they could gain some strength and prestige before I started amping the challenge level and we could see what some really advanced tier characters could do. But I told them that on a long enough time, knowing me, I'd get bored and the bloodlust would return and I would give them the usual challenging medicine that they had come to expect from a GM like myself. Well, they rolled up their new characters, bright-faced and ready for a new adventure, and our game began. It's kind of the same vibe that Ram has a, as a D&D GM as well. And Fallout New Vegas. That's probably a big part of the reason that I never get attached to my tabletop characters. <laughs> Ram tights killed them many times before. Also, one more last final for reals addendum here. <laughs> Blue and red. Blue's former no-surrender, I'll-eat-your-throat-and-sacrifice-your-kids-niad 
were rolled in as actual kin to each other. Where one was pure evil unbridled, however, Blue was the seemingly saccharine sister of her spiritual predecessor. I knew what I was in for, as did some of the party, and honestly I expected nothing less from such a wild card going into it. I was ready to watch the best laid plans of players and game masters fail, because intrigue and treachery and deceit and betrayal and bloodshed were all just kind of the name of the game. And I had one of my favorite chaotic elements in place to fuel that, as we set sail once more to the icy tundra. However, the disputes that arose as a result of the cumulative experience and resultant adjudications now lead me to present my case before this piratical court. I am curious as to the thoughts of my peers, so let us begin setting our scene. The Admiralty. The wet darkness of this stagnant hold is oppressive to your senses. You've been down there for weeks, the prisoners of a pirate captain who waylaid your previous ship en route to its destination. You were all merchantmen, once, your ship fat and heavy with treasure, mercilessly taken on the open seas by vultures that sought to feast on her corpse. Your crew was brought below decks as prisoners, and one by one, you watched them disappear from the hold as they were taken above deck, perhaps bartered off as slaves or ransomed as hostages or something far worse. What happened to them is a mystery that continues to haunt you. What you do know, however, is that the rolling ship hasn't stopped since that fateful battle, and she never seems to slow down. And you also know that all about you, it is growing colder and colder by the day. The light that seeps in through the cracks in the hull loses its strength, and your breath hangs before you in icy clouds and clings to your beards. It seems as if you're doomed to freeze to death in this dank prison when the banging of the hatch arrests your attention. A single stream of light pierces the darkness, and your eyes ache as they adjust to its cold radiance. Down the ladder he comes, a towering shadow of a man, a sea captain, spotlighted by the token ray of sun that pierces your prison. Disapprovingly, he turns to your cells and beholds you with scorn, his mate at his side, clutching a rolled piece of parchment in his hands. Admiralty as the captain, Listen up, you scurry dogs! You've been down in this hold for quite some time, and if I'm to be forthright, we've not the provisions to keep dead weight on this ship any longer. I've come to a choice. You can sign our articles and help sail this ship, and by my word, you'll receive accommodations for your service, or you'll find yourselves hungry until you're marooned at the next sighting of land. And this decision, of course, made itself. And one by one, as the mate prowled from cell to cell, the party signed the Articles of Agreement and were released from their confinement. New purpose was now found in this common enterprise. Now tasked with seeing the ship to its destination, they ascended to the deck and were met with a grisly sight. Several of the crew had expired during the night, frozen solid in place by the wintry winds and the spraying foam, and those above deck who were alive busily worked to parcel them in their hammocks and hurl them overboard. It was this first morbid funerary rite that the party were tasked to complete, and as they set to work, in silence, only Blue, ever cheerful in her morbidity, found the heart to disturb that stillness. Blue, why are we throwing them overboard? It's such a waste. The Admiralty is crewman. Just what are you getting at? Blue, I mean, the crewman. Why are we throwing them overboard? Times are hard. We could put them to use. Right out of the gate, and already, Blue was advocating for atrocity, albeit in a sweetly saccharine way. <laughs> Even some of the players were taken aback, notably Madigan and to a lesser degree, Alistair. Barely 15 minutes into this game, and I was already highly amused at the tension I was sure this would bring. The table was awkwardly quiet, as I called for her to roll against her tact skill in an effort to persuade her crewmates. Would they reconsider this funerary rite and instead process the meat of this frozen crew? RN Jesus came back with his answer, and the scene continued. I mean, it is an atrocity, but also you gotta do what you gotta do. Go ahead, me hearties, take a bite of the long pork. <laughs> so good it'll make you shiver. The Admiralty. A murmur of shock and disagreement erupts from some of the crew. 
Others nod in morbid agreement. It almost seems for a moment as if the matter is going to be put to debate between the two camps of sailors. That is, those who wish to honor their dead, and those who have lost their reason to the ravages of hunger. And so, a quarrel begins. But as quickly as it started, a pistol shot echoes out across the deck, and the first mate approaches, scowling, his weapon smoking as he points it to the sky. For a moment, all that can be heard is the pounding of the prow, and the sounds of his boots echoing with each step. Then, with all the authority of his position, he declares, Throw them overboard, or by thunder the lot of you will go overboard with them! Now, Blue's not stupid. <laughs> She's a veteran of this table. She can easily surmise that picking a fight with the first mate in the first session is probably a good way to die real quick. I mean, hell, even getting caught on the wrong end of a shitboard hunger riot would do the trick. And so she shrugged and happily set back to the work of parceling the dead. However, there's something now that must be addressed. We must speak to the point of contention that inevitably appeared during the course of this campaign. The ruling about it, and the subsequent fallout around which our tale is based. I would submit to this piratical court of my peers the first piece of evidence that resulted in the final encounter towards which we build. An open and casual advocacy for the practice of cannibalism in front of the entire crew. Something which, yes, ought to only be reserved for dire straits, like those in which this crew presently sailed, but also something which has a stigma so heavy that it ought to not be so casually discussed among even the most disreputable company. I could sense the lines being drawn already. This piece of below board knowledge, par for the course for Blue's character history, had conjured above board flashbacks to the dark jungles wherein Kale and Ingmund had fought and died beside the characters of Blue. The quiet confederations were forming in the background, whether we wanted them to or not. In a game of villains, one must ask, is it possible to be too villainous? Time would yet tell. I couldn't dwell on this conundrum, however, because I had a game to run, and so we continued our first roleplay-oriented session. The Admiralty, you finish your day's labors, the dead have been removed from the ship, and you've spent the day seeing her sail her route. As the bell rings to signal the shift of changes, you head below deck for a meager supper of thin soup. It's almost all water, and a stale piece of weevil-infested bread. Don't complain about the weevils, that's extra protein. <laughs> As you sit there, enjoying what little food can be afforded to you, you hear a shipmate cry out, I can't take it anymore! And stand up from where he sits, hucking the stale brick loaf against the wall. He then launches into a rant. The Admiralty is crewman. Every day it's the same damn thing! North says the captain, go north! I haven't even seen the captain in days! Never comes out of his quarters anymore! And whenever the mate goes in there for new orders, it's always the same damn thing! Bloody north! What the hell are we heading north for? We're dying on the decks! We're starving in the holds and he won't even tell us what for! I, I think he's gone mad! Got half a mind to take this damn ship for myself and head for warmer weather. I, I just, I just want to eat something again. Well, that's going to ratchet things up a notch, isn't it? <laughs> of course, a fight among the crew broke out over loyalty to the current captain while the party absconded from dinner and convened down in the cargo hold to try and figure out their next moves. The arguments were serious as Alistair remarked that the current crew was on the verge of mutiny and they were running out of food and... They found themselves in the middle of a ship ready to tear itself apart. So what was Alistair's proposition? Disappear. <laughs> At the first available opportunity, we're gone, and we leave them to their fate. It clearly seems like the captain has lost his mind. The party found themselves in agreement, prepared to jump ship at the first opportunity, and so they retired for the evening. Come daybreak, they were wrestled from their beds to the cry of, Land ho! And... I could feel the party's hope of freedom from that doomed mission being dashed when I described the wasteland that spread out before them. An open tundra that went on for miles in each direction, pristine and white and seemingly untouched by man. The ship itself had even ground to a halt now frozen solid in the ice. It seemed as if they would be moving no further. As the crew sat there and deliberated on what they ought to do next, the banging of the cabin doors caught their attention, 
and the leery captain walked out onto the deck to survey the situation. Without so much as regarding his crew, he announced, I guess we continue on foot. Alistair, on foot? To where? The Admiralty is the captain. You forget yourself. I advise you, withhold your incredulity lest you find yourself before the mast. Now, gentlemen, we've arrived, and we must continue on foot. You shall organize into shore parties and reconnoiter the surrounding area. A hundred doubloons to the first that finds sign of human activity among the ice. Bro, he's looking more and more crazy by the moment. <laughs> A solemn murmur of aye aye erupted from the beleaguered crew, and the captain took his leave. They stood then upon the deck, their mission assigned, and after a summary visit to their ship's quartermaster to gather supplies for their expedition, disembarked to explore the snowy wasteland. Not even two miles inland from where their ship had moored, they arrived upon the edge of a yawning, windswept canyon, and navigated a treacherous descent 500 feet into its bowels. And there, at the bottom of that frozen pit, minutes from succumbing to elemental exposure, they found the inviting mouth of a cave. The beleaguered party found their respite inside, the interior of the earth much warmer than the biting canyon through which they had navigated, and they shook off the cold. With the onset of night and the frigid conditions only worsening outside, they resolved that they would stay here until the morning. One by one, they lit their torches and began to advance inside. Kale, what can I discern about this cave? The Admiralty, uh, roll survival or smithing, your choice. Smithing roll, and he passed. So I said, this is not a natural formation. All along the walls, ceilings, and floors, you can see the traces of tooling marks. This cave was drilled out of the rock. Kale, then we'd best be on our guard. I tell the party, in a very thick Scottish accent, Oi, be careful, lads. This cave ain't natural. It looks like somebody dug it out. <laughs> so horrible. Uh... That warning came not a moment too soon, as they set off a trap trigger in the hall during their exploration. No bolt came to smite them, however. Instead, the walls of the earth shuddered and shook loose the dust of the ages, and before them, the earth opened wide into an antechamber, hidden beneath a stone facade. And beyond that, yet another door, opening into a hallway that led deeper into its bowels. The party paused for a moment, and then cautiously stepped forward. About them, interred in the walls, were the mummified remains of the titanic dead. They had found signs of human activity, all right. Alistair, a sly fellow, new to our table, but having heard rumors of how I like to challenge my players, opted that caution was the best course of action. Alistair, perhaps sounding a bit English. Oh God, we're combining the accents, okay. Whoa. Nobody better touch anything. We don't know what's down there, and we're only out here on reconnaissance anyway. I say we pass the night here, and we'll get back to the captain and report it in. The odds are good that whatever he's looking for is down here anyway. Ha. Oh. <laughs> this was met with agreement from my newbies and my veterans, save one. Blue. As the party went back to start a campfire at the mouth of the cave, should they need to make a hasty retreat back to the ship, Blue lingered there, in that hall of the dead, and prepared for those dead an offering. What offering did she give? More dead flesh. Carefully, she laid out some peculiar meat that she had saved from a certain dead crew member that she was tasked with sewing up earlier that session. She smiled and then returned to the group. Of course, she had been a bit less direct about it than that. Blue... I'd like to leave one of my rations behind as an offering on the floor of the antechamber. Okay, sure thing. And it was at that point that I cut the session. Oh, cliffhanger! <laughs> that first one, as things go, tended to be quite roleplay heavy, and mostly focused around plots and plans and setting the table for events to come. And set the table they did. So, let us now set forth the first few pieces of evidence which I submit to this maritime court. On behalf of the prosecution is the below-board piece of knowledge that Blue openly and casually advocated for cannibalism, a sentiment which was not taken well by the members of her crew, including other players, as in line with their character dispositions, most notably Madigan, very much a goody two-shoes stuck in the crew of pirates, for the defense, 
I submit this item for the esteemed court's consideration. The first, that Blue's characters above board are known very much to be a wild card by our group veterans, and she creates characters who complicate the lives of their fellow PCs. And yes, being at odds with your fellow PCs is encouraged here again. Duplicity, treachery, even killing your own crew from time to time is just all part of playing pirates. With this submission, I'll end the tale here for the jury to ruminate on. Rest assured that this tale is far from over. We still have several sessions before we get to the piece de resistance, the final adjudication that sent it all tumbling down. Shouts out to the Red X crew. I'll see you when I'm back to port, my friends, with yet another tale from the tabletop. Again, if you're interested in the tabletop games I've made, feel free to visit ramtide.itch.io and name your own price for the rulebook. Hope you don't mind the plugs. Thanks for reading. I mean, I already lean towards a guilty verdict. Like, <laughs> obviously you're just out here stirring stuff up for seemingly no reason in character but maybe there is some benefit to making an offering. I don't really know all that much about Blood and Thunder, but what I do know is that you could probably be a bit more covert with your <laughs> subtle actions against the party, you know? There is definitely a thing as being too evil, and I, I, I wouldn't trust this character as far as I could throw her with my above-board knowledge, my out-of-character knowledge. I'm like, okay, I know what you're about, really. But maybe some new piece of evidence will be brought to light that'll completely change my view on the situation. I'm excited to get some more Ram Tide stories and a tabletop one at that because that's what I really like. Painting a big grandiose scene for us to walk around in. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Like, comment, sub, share the video around if you did. I appreciate all those things. Follow me on all the stuff. Links in the description. Many, many links in the description, matter of fact. Thank you to my Patreon patrons, my YouTube channel members, beautiful people they are, helping me stay up during the month of January because it's hard out here. January, February is rough on YouTube, man. <laughs> but uh, we're going to make it. So thank you guys so much for helping me out. Lastly, of course, I would like to remind you all that you are loved, you are worthy, you definitely, definitely deserve it. And I shall see you in the next one. So until then, friends, bye-bye.